so uh, welcome everybody to uh, work from home, uh, Luma's work from home webinar series. Uh, this is Terry Kawaja, founder and CEO of Luma. And um, I'm delighted to be with you all. You know, we've done these, uh, we've done these topics in the past, largely on uh, business uh, issues, uh, which is, uh, which is great. Um, but uh, uh, I am, I am particularly delighted to be uh, talking about one of my passion points, uh, which is comedy. Uh, so this is, this is a lot of fun for me and, and kind of um, therapeutic. So uh, thanks for uh, all for taking part in this. So comedy uh, in business. Um, again, super delighted to uh, be talking about uh, a topic like this. So this is a part of our uh, regular Luma work from home webinar series that we do every Wednesday at 2 p.m. So, um, you know, tune in, uh, put it on your calendars. Wednesdays at 2 Eastern is gonna be when we have our work from home webinar series. And we've done it on a variety of topics. We've already covered stream wars. Uh, we've done identity and consumer privacy. Uh, today, of course, we're gonna be talking about comedy uh, in business, uh, which is a bit of a departure from our usual sort of digital media and digital marketing topics. Uh, but next week, we're back to uh, the more sort of day job uh, stuff. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, next week's uh, webinar will be on m and It will be on the state of industry consolidation. And I'm delighted to have uh, Anna Melissevic uh, of uh, Sparrow Advisors, who's going to join me. Um, um, Anna and her sister uh, put together a, a great analysis called the Third Epoch. And, uh, and uh, you can find that probably on, on their website or in social. And when I read it, I was like, wow, this is kind of exactly how we think of the world. And so uh, after we uh, conferred, over sort of what we both saw happening, I thought uh, Anna's perspective would be a, a great value add to that conversation. That's next Wednesday, April the 8th, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, State of Industry Consolidation. All right, so let's get to it, folks. The uh, agenda uh, for today is uh, sixfold. We are uh, gonna talk about why I do this, uh, a little bit on the science of comedy, uh, which, by the way, could be its own webinar, could be its own webinar series, quite frankly. Um, a little bit around comedy's effectiveness. Uh, my rules, I got five rules for comedy in business that I highly recommend for anyone contemplating this as something they may want to uh, pursue. Um, then we're going to uh, talk uh, specifically about comedy and, and COVID-19 or comedy and crisis, uh, because it does put some constraints on comedy. I want to talk specifically uh, about that. And that's a relevant thing when, you know, marketers that often use humor in their marketing have to really think about in a time like this, there's enhanced sensitivities and there's right ways and wrong ways of dealing with that. And then finally, we're gonna have some fun, right? We're gonna talk about some creative formats that I personally have utilized um, to, uh, and had a lot of fun with. And again, give some examples, including um, some, some uh, debuts uh, here. So you're gonna see it here uh, first, ladies and gentlemen, let's launch into it, shall we? So first up, by the way, how many people recognize that finger? Okay, so that would be everyone that's over the age of like 45, because um, that's actually from Monty Python. But um, all right, so first up is why I do this. Well, let's see. Um, I could probably come up with a number of rationales and reasons why I do this. I mean, number one, let's state it clearly, right? Uh, I'm obviously compensating for something. And, and you know what? You know, it's often said that comedians are compensating for something. And as it turns out, uh, unfortunately, I have a very, very, very small um, attention span. So uh, I know what you were thinking. Um, by the way, <laughs> cue number one, misdirection, uh, one of the key uh, elements of comedy. Um, so uh, uh, I actually was the second smallest person in my class in grade school growing up, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Ross Peterson. He was by far the smallest. I mean, that dude was like a midget. Um, uh, uh, sorry, a little person. Hmm. Hmm. See, uh, see above. 
Um, and, and thankfully, so he was like f at least four inches shorter than me, but I was pretty small and you know, I get picked on and, and, and called out. And so I don't know whether it was a defense mechanism. I can't tell you, I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I can tell you that uh, it uh, was a great equalizer. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it once I, once I started, started figuring things out uh, in, a, in a school context. But, um, but let's see, more closer to hand, I could argue, I could make the case that it's a very, very effective business strategy. Clearly, it's a differentiator uh, in terms of your personality vis-a-vis -vis sort of boring, normal other people. Um, I can tell you it builds affinity. I mean, I have relationships with people. There's so many people come up to me and say, oh, I love this or the humor or, and what have you. So that's, that's all great, but, but, but maybe more tactically, it's a phenomenal presentation aid. If, if, if I have the good fortune of being invited to speak on a stage, a brightly lit stage to a dark uh, room, I have two challenges to overcome. And in particular, as we live in this world where everyone's got a phone or a laptop or a, or a tablet in front of them, a screen of some kind that's commanding their attention, I have two challenges. Challenge number one is to garner people's attention. And then challenge number two is to hold their retention. What do I mean by that? Well, well, the first one is obvious. You, there's a million forms of distraction. And if you go to a conference, you can see this, right? While someone's talking on stage, everyone's got their heads down and they're on their phones. Now, maybe on the odd cue, often an audio uh, cue, uh, like laughter or, or some comment, people will uh, pick their heads up, look around, check it out, and back down, almost like it's in unison. Uh, it's really an incredible effect. And so if I feel like I have something important to impart on an audience, uh, then I have to capture their attention. And I use a variety of tactics, including uh, sound effects because audio cues are a really great way to garner someone's attention away from when they're when they're not looking at you. And, and then secondly is humor. I use jokes because the first time they miss your joke, everyone else is laughing and they missed it because they weren't looking, paying attention. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're like, oh, damn, I missed a joke. Second joke they miss they're like, that's it. I'm going to pay attention because I don't want to miss any more jokes. So, so it turns out that there's actual business reasons as to why I uh, try and uh, involve humor uh, in my presentations. And then finally, I got to get you to remember what I said, because even if I have said something brilliantly and I managed to uh, capture your attention, well, it isn't going to do any good if you don't remember it. And so I use graphics and also sound effects. I remember in 2010, I gave a presentation uh, at an IAB conference to a packed house, 500 people. And I was talking about, it was where I first introduced the Lumiscape, and I was talking about the point I was trying to make is that Google, with their acquisition of DoubleClick and then their uh, subsequent acquisition of Invite and ultimately AdMeld, and as we all know what's happened since, that they were coming into display advertising in a big way. And I could just have said that, I suppose, but in one ear out the other. Instead, I had the Lumiscape up there with the Google logo animating coming into the sound of Jaws. Dun, 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 dun. And let me tell you something, that hit home. I, to this day, 10 years from having made that presentation, I have people come up to me and say, I still remember the, the you know, Jaws soundtrack. And of course, What's happened since is very much they became the shark and ate everyone. But um, nonetheless, uh, I have found that graphics and humor are great aids for both capturing attention and retention. Okay, great. So fine, you've got an effective business strategy out of humor, but it almost doesn't matter, right? One and two are irrelevant because of number three. It's just in my nature. So yeah, I've been a banker for over 30 years. Can you believe that? I must be really freaking old. At any rate, turns out I've been a comedian for over 50. This particular shot was taken in Boston, Massachusetts in 19, six, the fall of 1968. So while uh, America was melting down uh, that year, uh, there I was um, uh, telling jokes uh, as a five-year-old. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose if it's in my nature to tell jokes, if that's who I am, 
then if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be natural. It wouldn't be authentic. And we all know that authenticity works and builds trust because if I'm faking it, if I'm trying to be someone else, that's not going to work. And, and, and you know, I got to level with you. If since we're speaking of authenticity, okay, clear admission here. I was not in 1968 holding onto a microphone. I was doing comedy, but in this picture, I was not holding onto a microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, I was holding onto a spoon. Uh, this was uh, in our dining room in uh, Somerville, Mass. At uh, at dessert, I'm, it looks like I've got some uh, ice cream there. Uh, so uh, just since we're being authentic and keeping it real. Uh, that was the actual uh, picture of it. Okay, so uh, early comedic influences. Let me tell you something. Comics are not, I, I suppose there's an element of sort of natural people who are naturally inclined to it, but you have to light the spark. And for me, it was it was comedy like, like Ronan Martin's Laugh-In and Benny Hill in the early days, Flip Wilson, Steve Martin, George Carlin. These people were huge. Uh, Johnny Carson, I watched religiously. Uh, I know I was a kid. I probably shouldn't have stayed up that late, but I did. And uh, I, I, you know, he taught me a lot about comedic timing and, and the like. Uh, later on, of course, National Lampoon. And then, you know, who can forget the early days of SNL, which were just a comedic uh, bonanza. Um, and then, and then uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus. I could, I can recount every line in every movie that that they've made. These were my early sort of comedic influences that I think, you know, had a, had a big influence, but it wasn't just the popular media, the things that you know. I also happened to attend a high school, O'Connor College School in Toronto, the suburbs of Toronto in Don Mills, that I would describe as a, a very uh, art-centric, funny school. It was a funny environment. And uh, some of my uh, contemporaries, were incredibly funny people. Here's three of them uh, that had a particular influence on me. Elvira Kurt um, uh, was a phenomenal uh, uh, comedian, Rick Wharton and Kevin Lund. Now, if I were to tell you that two of these three are still in the arts today doing comedy, and one of them uh, became a digital marketing executive, in other words, total fucking sellout, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can probably guess which one is which. Uh, uh, no offense to Kevin. So, Elvira Kurt, as it turns out, was a great comedian in high school, and she's a great comedian today, 40 years, 42 years since. So uh, she does, she has her own shows. Um, she does uh, uh, stand up. She's a fantastic comic uh, working in Canada, uh, living in Toronto. My friend Rick Wharton um, was another, another amazing talent, by the way. Each one of these individuals has got more comedic talent in their pinky finger than I have uh, ever had and ever will have. Uh, Rick is an incredible guy. He, th this guy was the king of the improv. This guy could turn uh, like a paperclip into a complete uh, hysterical uh, comedy set just by winging it. Um, he ended up working for Second City. He was a comedian at Second City and he's still in the arts. He's producing events and into the music scene and the like. And he's just a fantastic uh, uh, comedic mind. And Kevin Lund, oh my God, this man was just born funny. Uh, he and I must have had more just side splitting laughing sessions than I can, I can count. Uh, the man is total comedy. He too was using his comedy, became a screenwriter and a producer in Hollywood. And like I said, now he's a seller. I mean, uh, sorry, digital media executive. Uh, sorry, I used that wrong, wrong phrase. I'm kidding. Um, I'm in digital media too. And so, yeah, fine, whatever. Um, at any rate, uh, so these are influences that really, really, uh, really, really matter. Uh, that's, so that's why I do it. In terms of science, you know, it turns out this is, this is real, right? Uh, turns out when we laugh, two chemicals are produced. Uh, one is C158H251N39046S. I know what you're thinking, fucking hilarious, right? And, 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 and not to be outdone by C8H11NO2, which is, let's face it, also knock your socks off funny. Um, of course, I'm referring to endorphins, 
and dopamine. So here's how it works. The, <laughs> yes. Endorphins are secreted from the pituitary gland. It turns out they activate the prefrontal cortex of our brain and the limbic system. These are natural happy hormones that sort of cause pleasure. And, and, and what I find very particularly interesting, and this will come into the rules later, uh, it's facilitated by both ethanol and cannabis. No surprise uh, there. So that's the sort of the funny bone of the brain, uh, if you will. Now, dopamine, this is a little different, right? This is secreted from the brain itself and travels throughout the nervous system. This is a neurotransmitter. In fact, they're both neurotransmitters that have many health benefits. I could go on and on about the science of comedy, but here's, here's an incredible coincidence. Laughing, humor, uh, uh, helps uh, excrete dopamine, which bolsters the immune system. Folks, this is in a time of uh, coronavirus, uh, we all could use some help with the immune system. So it's just fascinating. And when you really delve into the science further, like I said, this is an endless topic, but essentially what's going on here is it, and, and as I've been told, been told about opioids, whatever, been told, um, that is that they, you know, open your mind, right? LSD, Timothy Leary, open your mind. Um, it literally opens your mind. Cracks open the capillaries of your uh, neurotransmitter receptors and, and that allows you to just plop in whatever message you have to, to give, whether that's the comedy. Again, in business purposes, I use that mind opening opportunity to drop in hopefully some day job uh, knowledge as well. That is one of the reasons why people remember stuff that's associated with comedy or, or a joke. Um, so there's just a little bit on the science of comedy. Trust me, it works. Um, Next up, uh, I want to talk about the effectiveness of comedy. Look, you, you, you all know from your own lives that um, th these people that we all know and love um, uh, have a major impact you know, on, on your life. Imagine going through uh, you know, this, this horrific, uh, uh, draconian, uh, dystopian existence that we find ourselves in now without comedy. Of course, I'm referring to the Trump administration, but uh, but yes, it got worse with uh, COVID-19. Uh, but again, you know, these are the people are bringing you know peace of mind in a world that seems to have gone off the rails. Uh, they bring truth to power, so they're able to say something. You know, the the court jester, right? And in, in all throughout history, was really the only one that could call bullshit on the king. Uh, so you really, you know, there's real value to the court jester having their role. And we've seen it, political action, accountability, charity causes, comedians can bring real value to the world at large. And it's not just the world at large, even in the context of business, much has been written about uh, how to utilize comedy. And I'm sure these are people who have thought about it a lot more than I. So I encourage you to read uh, their books, including Peter McGraw's book, uh, Shtick to Business, which just came out uh, this morning and I've heard is uh, fantastic. I look forward to reading that. But uh, I can tell you that uh, I too have, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so here's here's my uh, vain attempt uh, to explain my cord of one. Of course, there are this cohort of investment bankers out there, and they tend to be, you know, very stiff and, you know, arithmetic or financially oriented pinheads. And then, of course, <laughs> You have the comedians who, you know, the, the, the dichotomy here between science and art probably couldn't be any greater. And I'm pretty sure they don't overlap by much, but where they do is kind of where I find myself. And, and I love uh, going back and forth uh, between the two worlds. And look, uh, some have said, hey, why don't you, many have said, why don't you just do comedy? It's clearly what you love. Why don't you just go and be a comedian? Well, the answer is, uh, uh, doesn't pay much. Uh, it does, it can, right? You get people like uh, Jerry Seinfeld made over a billion dollars as a comedian. And, you know, I could pick out a handful of folks that have made, you know, lots of money uh, doing what they love. But uh, I have a day job and it turns out my day job, I'm pretty good at that too. And if I can somehow manage to do both, then great. And I'm not recommending that everyone or anyone become a professional comedian by all means. 
try your hand at open mic night, but um, maybe stick to a day job unless you know that this is something you want to pursue. In my world, uh, uh, in fact, I've even thought of a uh, you know potential future TED talk I call "Laughing All the Way to the Bank," where I somehow marry together these worlds of both the fun stuff as well as the day job of of business. And should I be able to pull this off? In fact, if I get to use uh, comedy in my day job, I view that as a, a equivalent of uh, Maslow's uh, self-actualization. Because yeah, doing deals is nice, uh, but doing comedy and deals and comedy and deals together would be the complete nirvana. Look for the book laughing all the way to the bank, not in bookstores anytime soon. Okay, uh, next up is I've actually given some thought to this, um, what one should do if they were to um, pursue some utilized humor uh, in their day job. And I have five rules and here they are. Terry's five rules for comedy for business. Um, number one, be fucking funny. Uh, none of this works if you're just trying and not succeeding. Uh, so perhaps that would mean uh, being realistic with yourself and getting some objective feedback. Uh, second is practice, 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 right? Don't, don't try out a new joke in front of 500 people at a, or at a board meeting with uh, very important clients in the room because anything else is a career limiting move. So Number one, you got to be funny. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't work. Well, not only do you have to be good at the humor, my suggestion would be be good at your day job. Look, this isn't for everyone, right? I mean, if you're a mediocre banker, uh, you're not going to make up for it by being funny. So I'm going to suggest that make sure you focus on your day job first, be really good at that. Then you've got some license to maybe try uh, some humor. Number three, pick your spots. Look, it's, there's a difference between being funny and being viewed as a clown, right? A clown is not taken seriously. And that's when people inappropriately just try to be funny in all situations. They don't have any sense of the on off uh, switch. And so, you know, pick your spots, right? Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later because uh, I talk about understand the three elements of comedy, look, People have written about this far deeper and greater than I, but to me, it boils down to, comedy boils down to three things, community of interest, timing, and alcohol. Remember the ethanol as the catalyst uh, uh, above to, to uh, the dopamine uh, inhibitors. Um, so, so community of interest. This is when, you know, general comics like Jerry Seinfeld and others who goes, you ever notice that because they're trying to make reference to common things that we all experience. Well, that's great uh, for general comedians, uh, hor horizontal strategy, but it applies doubly in business, if we're in particular in business in a particular vertical. So if I'm at a conference and uh, we're talking about digital media, I can make a joke about Google or DoubleClick or something like that, that we all get, because we all understand it, we all get the context. And we know that not the whole world will get the context. So you kind of feel like you're in that sort of club. And that's why community of interest works particularly well for uh, business applications of, of comedy. Second is timing. Timing is timing, right? It either works or it doesn't. And there's, again, you can read a whole litany of things about comedic timing, but uh, you really do uh, the, the exact same. Suffice to uh, know that the exact same words delivered even like a half a second uh, earlier or later than is optimal can make the difference between hilarious, laugh on the floor funny, and kind of not funny at all. So timing is absolutely critical. And look, when given the choice, right, don't do comedy at an 8 a.m. board meeting. Uh, wait till the afternoon and preferably, you know, try it out at a dinner or once people have imbibed a little bit, it really does help. This is why comedy uh, stores have a two drink minimum. Uh, they got to get you drinking so that uh, you will be laughing. And then finally, my fifth rule is know where the line is. Now, notice I didn't say don't step over the line. I just said know where the line is. Uh, be edgy, at least my view on comedy is you got to be edgy without getting in trouble much. 
because uh, here's the thing. Um, there's bland comedy out there, right? There's, uh, they're great comedians, but they've just sort of dumbed down their comedy for the particular show that they have. And, and I'm thinking of like the Tonight Show. So Jay Leno was comedy for Middle of America. Yes, I know Jay is funny. I see him funny in other contexts. It's not funny at all to me on the Tonight Show. Uh, uh, not much uh, uh, difference with the current uh, Tonight Show host. And look, I get it. They're funny people, but they're intentionally dumbing down their comedy to suit, I guess, the broad masses, the, the middle of the country. Who, who, I don't know who their audience is. It isn't me. Uh, you know, I prefer David Letterman or I prefer, um, you know, um, uh, comedians that you know that 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 have an edge. Uh, Ricky Gervais is one of my favorite comedians. People that you know are really bringing some tension uh, to the comedy. I like that edginess. Now, in a business context, I suppose you could just issue pablum um, to be safe, but it, to me, it just isn't that funny. So I like to toy with that line of uh, what is sort of acceptable and not by by being uh, edgy and, and that's me. So those are my uh, five rules. And, and now let's talk about that last uh, issue of, of edginess and, and in particular when we're in an environment as we are now. Look, um, clearly what is not the right answer is don't do any comedy at all. Man, how can you be insensitive? Uh, people are dying. Yes, we have an incredibly horrific, tragic, serious, uh, dystopian, horrible situation, and and trying to bring some levity to some aspects of it done right does not mean that you're insensitive to the environment you find yourself in. Do you have to adjust your comedy? Absolutely. You do not want to be tone deaf, but you want to try and leverage. I mean, first of all, how do you get through a dark days like this without some comedy? All you have to do is look at the shows. The comedians are on fire right now, even in the in, in their own basements without all the assets and accoutrement of their studios. They are pumping out fantastic comedy. I remember back to 9-11 when, um, when we were really in the depths of it, in particular here in New York City. And, and we just, it was, it was hard to figure out when are we coming out of this? It's sort of, we're all walking around in a daze. And to me, when, when the, the moment when I felt like there was some semblance of normality was the late night comics. They came back and yeah, they did the unthinkable. They made jokes about 9-11. Again, not, 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 in a, not in a trashy or disrespectful way, but 9-11 had to be in the joke. It's hard to avoid it, right? Um, and today, I think you're seeing some excellent work. Uh, most comedians uh, are doing a great job of towing the appropriate line of saying, you got to address it, you got you to involve it, and yet somehow not be seen to be trying to take advantage of it. Um, uh, but I think without comedy, we don't have any hope. And without hope, there's no future. So, so the answer is not to shut it off. It's to really deal with it in a... In a, in a sort of nuanced way. And look, I have done my own uh, version of this. Yesterday, I published my latest parody, We Will Survive uh, COVID-19, uh, using uh, uh, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. We'll sample a little bit of it later. And, and look, this wasn't without considerable consideration. I, I wrote this nine days ago, and nine days ago felt like a different world. Um, and so I actually adjusted it. I added a serious PSA. I took out a bunch of industry uh, cameos that I had planned for it and, and sort of reoriented the message to be, to be reflective of sort of the reality that we find ourselves in now. But the decision was, but, but by all means publish, people need an anthem for hope. People need some kind of levity in this sort of disaster we find ourselves in. And well, you be the judge, but the feedback so far has been, has been phenomenally positive where I think most people have said, yeah, I think he kind of struck the right uh, tone. By the way, that not everyone will react that way. You know, a few people on Twitter said, this isn't funny and this is inappropriate and that's fine. Uh, look, um, if you made, if you, oh, here's a good one. If you make humor for 100% of the audience, no one's ticked off, no one thinks you crossed the line, you failed. You absolutely failed. That means you produced pablum and it probably wasn't that funny. 
And I have less respect for that than I do for someone trying to find 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 where that edge is. And this one, I think I, I, I did a good enough job, or I hope I did a good enough job. We never uh, fully know. And then finally, so creative formats with uh, examples. I have used a variety of formats for what I try to get across in, in terms of humor, uh, including everyday life. Like, like uh, there's no off button on comedy in, in my life. So whether it's a quip or um, a graphic that I'll make up um, and then post to social media, um, I've done comedy skits, uh, I do in business closer to home, I do lots of art, uh, including creatives uh, for closing dinners, uh, anywhere from you know limericks to videos. I've done a whole series of magazine covers, uh, fake magazine covers, and then of course the parody videos. I give you a little bit of a sample of some of that. So my everyday life and social posts, look, this is just me responding to stimuli that I see in the ecosystem. <laughs> Um, you know, when, when Bernie Sanders was like the billionaires and, and when he was going on and on, uh, it just, it seemed to me, wow, do Bolsheviks always point? Um, and sure enough, apparently they do. Um, uh, that seemed uh, obvious, the coronavirus situation, the, the analogy to, to Mad Max seemed, seemed obvious. Um, you know, S S Scott Galloway and his phenomenal um, uh, podcast. Uh, I couldn't help but doing uh, Prof G bingo uh, with all kinds of terms that he uses uh, almost every day. Uh, so you can play uh, Prof G bingo. Of course, I'm a frequent uh, uh, subject or object of my comedy is, is the uh, chief clown himself, the orange clown, Donald J. Trump, who I think is a complete joke and uh, a fantastic uh, foil. That one I mean. So not only am I trying to be funny, I'm also trying to be uh, effective. And I've done a lot uh, to try and bring the world to see the ridiculousness of that buffoon and using comedy as, as my tool. But you know, if it's stuff in industry or friends that post a picture and I sort of feel like, yeah, that, that warrants something. By the way, the upper right is, um, is when, when we, in the Democratic uh, Convention or, um, contest. When we got down to two white male septuagenarians were the finalists, Bernie and Joe, uh, to be who, who will be the nominee. Uh, I thought, great, when I'm older, uh, I can run too. So that's my uh, campaign photo for Kawaja 2056, um, uh, when I'll be in my 90s. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll, uh, hopefully, hopefully old white men will not, in fact, be winning uh, leadership nominations uh, by then. And we'll have seen the light. Uh, that more uh, diverse uh, options uh, should uh, should be warranted. Um, okay, so that's just everyday life. Company skits, let me tell you, every single company I've been at, and even before that, I was doing skit comedy uh, at Salman Brothers, where I was for 12 years and became a partner, ultimately heading global uh, media m and in, in the 90s, doing, doing lots of deals. I also uh, had a life as the comedian at our annual outing. So we would get together, play golf or tennis, and then afterwards, I would do a weekend update-like format where I would tell jokes, often uh, ad hominem jokes, picking on the single most powerful uh, people in the uh, firm. And it became such that this was quite popular. People would show up just for this event. And, and I was in classic Solomon Brothers style, very sort of sharp elbow um, uh, culture, I was not kind. I was. These were not lighthearted uh, chuckle jokes. These were eviscerating takedowns, brutal takedowns of these powerful people. Now, how did that not ruin my career? You ask. Well, uh, at Solomon Brothers, you know, this was a this was a real asset. In fact, this became so popular that the people would would try to get me to talk about them. Because if I didn't, if I ignored them, it meant they weren't that powerful. And so it, it really, what it ended up doing for me was, well, well, sorry, what it ended up doing for them was it humanized them. Uh, and so the, the targets of my comedy absolutely loved it. It's like, you know, when Ricky Gervais takes down Hollywood's elite, they bristled at first, right? There's a sting at first, but now they've all come around and they'll love it. And, you know, he's been back five times and it's worked for the Hollywood Foreign Press and for NBC. And it's actually, I think it's really humanized the industry. I think it's been great. 
Um, and, and at Salman Brothers, it was uh, likewise uh, went over well. For me, it just elevated me. All of a sudden, I was like a peer to people far more senior uh, than me just because I had this platform, this soapbox as the comedian. Now, I don't recommend it for anyone and everyone. Um, it's tricky. And yes, there are, I'm sure, plenty of stories of people who try to be funny, in particular in that manner, and uh, <clears throat> end up uh, <clears throat> losing their uh, jobs as a result. Uh, the culmination of my Salman Brothers career in comedy, uh, and not what not what caused an end to it, but uh, the culmination of it was when after having done this for years, I did this like six years in the early to mid 90s. And then I sort of put the pause button on for a few years and then and then was promoted to partner uh, at the firm. And then in 1999, two years after I was promoted to partner, so I was safe. Um, we did a merger with uh, Smith Barney travelers and then another merger with uh, with us, with Citigroup. Uh, so we became this colossal financial organization with 168,000 employees. And we had this partners meeting of hundreds and hundreds of partners in Key Largo, Florida. And really it was the first time that the three groups, the city people, the travelers, Smith Barney people, and the Solomon Brothers people were getting together for the first time. So there was a it was an agenda, obviously, during the day when we would have a bunch of sessions on the equity markets, the M&A markets, fixed income markets, et cetera. So day job stuff. And then in the evenings, there was, you know, lavish uh, parties that we threw everywhere. This was a social gathering for people to really get to know each other. And the chairman of the firm came to me two weeks prior and he said, Terry, I got a I got a challenge for you. I want you, we have the, you know, MD outing coming up in Key Largo. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I want you to bring the act back. I said, what? He said, I want you to bring the act back. And I said, are you crazy? I said, these are politically different times. We got total audiences that don't know me, don't know what we did back in the day at Solomon Brothers. I mean, I said, the, the, I said you'll get three reactions. The Solomon Brothers people will say, all right, Terry's back, awesome. The Smith Barney people will be like, what? And the Citigroup people won't be saying anything because their jaws will be on the ground. And he said, exactly, and I wanna send a message. And I said, well, listen, I appreciate you wanting me to be the blunt object of your message, as you call it, but I wanna keep my job, thank you very much. And he said, no, 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 I'll protect you. Uh, I'm like, fine, that's as long as you have a job. Bottom line was he gave me strict orders to go as close to the line as possible without going over. Well, two weeks later, it's two days before this thing. I had written a damn thing. I'm busy. And now I'm fucked, right? I'm about to go in front of the entire partnership of this combined company and I got nothing. So I seclude myself in a conference room, no calls. I told my secretary and I start writing and it's hard to, you know, command creativity, you know, on, on demand, but this one worked. And I was writing and I'm furiously writing like 10 pages worth of stuff and it's coming to me. So this is going to be great. And uh, I get interrupted by a phone call. It's the two vice chairmen. And they're like, uh, we need legal to look at the script. These are different environments. I'm like, fuck you. I said, I haven't even written it yet. Goodbye. And I hung up. And what I told my partner, we did this in a, in a pair, in a, unis in pair uh, a pair in a, a weekend update format. We had all these great bits and I, we had 16 bits and I wrote a 17th one. I told him, okay, we're going to go with this bit at the very end, only in one scenario. He, I read the bit to him and he said, no fucking way are we going to do that bit. You can't do that bit. And I said, no, no, no. I understand your sensitivities. Here's the thing. If we're doing poorly, we don't do the bit. If we're doing well, we don't do the bit. If we're killing it, we don't do the bit. If we absolutely have crushed this room, everyone is in the floor, spilling, laughing their guts out, that's our license, then we get to do the bit. He was resigned, he goes, well, I don't think I can stop you. Fast forward, we get there, we own the room. We absolutely own this room, they're dying. I go do the bit. It's like, I, wouldn't, I couldn't tell it to you in the same context now. Build up a ton of tension, uh, popped it, and the place was pandemonium. So yes, there are uh, uh, opportunities to use edgy comedy in business context uh, and make it work. And by the way, the uh, 
CEO of the overall firm, uh, Derek Mon, came up to me and he said, Terry, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to have you do that at the next uh, Citigroup board meeting. I was British. And I said, thanks, uh, Derek. You know, the good news about that is tomorrow you'll be sober and you'll forget you said that uh, because there's no goddamn way I would do that for the board at like 8 a.m. or something. So uh, lots of uh, business applications. I now do them at closing dinners. You know, here's uh, three deals uh, that we've done over the years. I wrote uh, closing dinner limericks for. Um, interestingly, uh, this is a great format if you're sort of don't under the time crunch and often we're busy. Uh, I remember showing up, up at the Demdex closing in 2011 and I came to the realization a half hour before the dinner started that I hadn't done any uh, creatives for the dinner. So I sat on the stoop outside and wrote the Demdex closing limerick, which went over well. Um, same thing with Hook Logic, same thing with the uh, clip. I'm not going to, I was going to, I was going to read the clip one, but it, it, it takes too long. Uh, I posted that. It was a, a lot of fun by bringing context to the transaction at hand. Then there's fake magazine covers. And, you know, some of you may know, um, oopsie. I lost my um, that, um, I do these, uh, fake uh, fake covers um which um let me just make sure that i got my audio there we go okay good uh of all kinds of people they 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 tend to be people i know and like uh so they tend to be friends or colleagues um and and they're they're generally positive sometimes there's a tweak in there or two a little tension never hurts but um you know it's a catalyst is usually their birthday or an appointment or some reason why I just decide on a whim to just make up uh, a cover. Uh, these things don't take very long to do, they take a few minutes, um, but they've had an incredible uh, impact. Um, so here's three uh, examples. So Nadis Dorado is a wonderful, wonderful human being and, and friend and, and uh, she's now at Facebook, but, but she was just appointed, uh, she was at Axiom I believe, and she was appointed to be the CEO of a of a startup company in digital marketing called Verve, subsequently sold. And, um, and so I made this fortune covers one of my early ones uh, with the headline location, 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 why the future of advertising is a lot like real estate and lots of other inside uh, jokes along the way. So uh, funny thing is a couple months after I do this, and by the way, this, you know, made its way in social media. I get, I get a, I get a meeting actually, uh, from Nada, and she tells me, Terry, you got me in a lot of trouble. And I said, I did? Do tell. And she said, well, I got this call from, like, she's not a Serbian, and she got a call from, like, the Serbian consulate, uh, where she was requested to go to lunch with the princess or queen of Serbia, or some royalty. And she's like, oh my goodness. So she goes to the lunch at the Four Seasons, and she's, you know, wow, to what do I owe this honor? And and you know, royal queen or princess says, "Well, it's not every day that a you know daughter of Serbia gets to you know have such an incredible thing happen." She's like, "Well, it's a it's a startup in the digital marketing space. I mean, we're you know we're giving it our college try, but thanks." She goes, "Oh no, it's not every day you get to be on the cover of Fortune magazine." And she holds up my cover, so it fooled uh, royalty, and not of course then you know covered her head and said, "I." Oh shit, let me tell you about Terry Kawaja. Um, so may, may have been an embarrassing moment uh, to which I uh, responded to Nadia, you're welcome. Uh, because how many people get to meet the queen of their uh, country? Uh, another example, uh, uh, Rafat uh, Ali, who is a fantastic guy and a great entrepreneur. He's the CEO of a vertical travel business uh, uh, digital media company uh, called Skift, uh, a great company. Um, and uh, yeah, I profiled him on the cover of Forbes. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, what I learned from Nada Surat was, yeah, I better put on there somewhere that this is fake, just so you know I don't cause break too much more glass. But even when you do do that, this one says, if you've read this far, you realize this is a brilliant fake. Um, is turns out, you know, Rafat originally from India, and you know we all have followers on Facebook. He has thousands, if not tens of thousands of followers, because he's a you know, boy from India who done good. And uh, a lot of people in India follow him. So when I posted this and tagged him on Facebook, 
he literally had thousands of people commenting, saying, oh my God, congratulations, Rafat. I always knew you'd be on the cover of a big magazine. So they just don't, they don't even know. They, they just thought it was real. So he got a big uh, kick out of that. And then finally, another uh, sort of example of how it can be effective just this fall, my uh, keeping with the India theme, I, I, I profiled uh, my good friend, Rashad Tabakawala, Chief Strategy Officer at Publicis, who came out with a book. He was, in fact, he was coming out with a book it, it published in February, but in November, came out and announced Restoring the Soul of Business, How to Stay Human in the Age of uh, Data. And so I gave him his Soul Man uh, cover uh, on Fortune's, uh, you know, updated uh, uh, cover uh, format. And this time, you know, I've learned to put major warnings in red, warning fake magazine covers can be more worthy than real ones. Uh, and he attributes this as contributing to his movement, uh, this part of a campaign that uh, he went from, uh, I don't know, uh, over 100 in Amazon's pre-order list to in the top 10. So turns out comedy uh, can be effective, uh, very effective uh, in, this, in this context. By the way, I think I'm going to launch a poll right now. We still have 100 uh, people on. So let me, let me ask you, uh, these are the diehards out there right now. Um, have you done comedy? Just while I'm going through this stuff and I'm talking about some examples and the effectiveness of comedy, but I'm curious. Obviously, those tuning into this are interested in the topic. So um, I'm just curious of the people on have you done comedy? And, and uh, I see, um, that's great. I'll leave this up for 30 seconds. Ah, still lots of voting, but look, it's, it's over, it's over 90%. Uh, I'm sure that, that would have stayed consistent if we'd have kept going. Uh, so 40 of the 45 responders to that poll said they've done comedy and that's, that's heartening. Um, that's heartening to see. Um, okay, uh, so the final format uh, that I want to uh, talk about um, is, uh, is uh, oh, right, yeah, sorry, uh, as I mentioned, in these, uh, this, uh, this is particularly the Maclean's is a major uh, magazine in Canada, it's the Time, Inc., uh, Time Magazine of Canada, and this is my, uh, my college uh, friend and, and New York, original New York roommate, Andy Saxon, who ran for, for office last year, didn't win, uh, at least not yet, but uh, I made up made him on his birthday a a cover McLean's cover uh, that said "Meet Canada's Next Prime Minister: How Andy Saxon is Reshaping the Face of Compassionate Conservatism." Um, again, as all as I do now on all of these, with a blatant disclosure, a warning that fake magazine covers you know that it's fake, right? And despite that, people still think that these are real and. I just laugh when I see uh, those those responses. Um, okay, so I'm gonna play a few uh, examples of some of the comedy uh, I have done. Um, let's see, I'm just taking a look at Q and A. All right, so the, here's a great, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions before I launch into that. Here's a great question from Carrie Leonard about roughly how long does it take you to create one of our, one of my parodies? Well, I often actually get this question, which is, when, do, how do you have the time to do this? I love that question because I don't know, maybe it assumes that this is all I do. Um, for the most part, I'm multitasking. So if I make a cover, two things. Number one, magazine cover usually takes me, I don't know, certainly under 10 minutes, uh, sometimes even faster than that. And it really just matters to come up with the right copy. But I have this down to a science now. I mean, if I'm gonna make a cover of you, uh, I've already got the format with the titles of about 10 different, probably 20 different magazine titles. I know the, I have the font there. So all I got to do is come up with a copy and an image. So putting it together is actually pretty, pretty quick. Um, other memes that I produced are even less than that. I do most of my memes in under 60 seconds. A parody is obviously more involved. Um, and, and, and I'll talk about that uh, in, a, in, a, in, in actually uh, a minute here. Um, in fact, the next title talks about uh, just that, my, my methodology for these, for these parodies. So first thing I have to do is, is there has to be a catalyst for the subject, right? So I think of, oh, that's something I should parody. 
like for example, when Donald Trump goes on at these press conferences saying all the stupid freaking things while he's standing right next to everyone and shaking everyone's hand, I'm like, oh my God, I should do a parody about that. Then I have to think of, well, what song would suit that? And by the way, the appropriate song is a mixture of sort of like the lyric structure and the mood, right? Because different songs have, have different moods. Uh, then I have to write the lyrics. And quite frankly, that doesn't take long at all. Often I'll write lyrics to a parody song in 30 minutes, uh, or I'll get, put it this way, I'll get 95% of it done in 20 minutes. And then I may take a couple hours to get the last five, 10 or five or 10 percent, but it doesn't take long to write the lyrics. Then I got to find the, the, the singer, uh, um, get them to record it. And I have wonderful people helping me uh, with that. Thank you, John Gordon. He's in the credits of every one of these. I now, then I have to make the video. Thank you, Adam Platt, my video editor. Now I did all my own video editing until I discovered, fuck it, why don't I use people that are even better at it than me? And my, uh, uh, Terrific uh, analyst Adam does a great job now of editing, of editing uh, my videos. So all in all, there's a lot of moving parts to the process here, but I have now done three of these uh, parodies, soup to nuts, concepting, picking the song, writing the lyrics, getting it sung, making the video and publishing in one day. So it shows that you can get it done in a relatively compact uh, period of mind. Um, so how, what communities do I keep an eye on now? I've, uh, I've talked about a few of those. Um, awesome. Uh, good. Uh, so I want to, um, I wanted to take you through some of these, uh, some of these examples. Maybe we'll come back to a little bit of Q and A if we have time at the end. I'm noticing that it's three minutes to the hour, but Hey, we'll just keep going. Uh, these are not fixed. Uh, I'll just give you a few, uh, samples of some of the things. Uh, I've done in the in the parody world, and by the way, I discovered these are these have thankfully these have garnered you know millions of, of views, uh, which I find hilarious. Um, and and uh, and you know I'll I'll demonstrate one of the reasons why I do them, not just to be funny, but they, I think they also work for business purposes. I have discovered in the last five the power of the cameo. Uh, why have me parading around my ugly mug? Uh, I'm utilizing other people in the industry. And as you'll see, there's been a progression of these where more and more senior people are being in these cameos. We'll, we'll talk about some of those. So going back to like some of my very first ones, I remember um, in, here's a, here's a sort of sampling of, of uh, let's see, uh, 30 different parodies. There's two, there could be two pages of these videos, but here's thumbnails on, on 30 of them. And I'm just gonna pick a handful and, and give you some, uh, some examples. Um, so starting off early on, 11 years ago, right, in 2009, we're in the midst of the financial crisis, and I decided to uh, make a video of, that I called Matt Avenue Blues about what was going on in advertising and marketing. It was a dire time. By the way, notice that at the time I was working, I wasn't, I didn't have my own firm, so I had to use a nom de plume. Uh, L. McDuff is short for Lady McDuff, which is my yellow lab at the time. Um, since passed on, rest in peace, uh, Lady McDuff. Uh, but I was using a nom de plume because uh, it just it didn't it didn't fit with necessarily with my day job, and it was early days, so uh, they didn't really understand this stuff. This was when, if you recall, in in early '09, things were looking pretty bad, and I needed a a, a sad ballad to reflect this. Here's just a few of the opening lines. One, two, one, two, three. Not so long time ago, I can still remember how the big three used to give you reach. If you splurged on a TV spot, your brand could really gain a lot. At least that's what they told you in the speech but the digital revolution felt like thunder with every paper that went under bad news on the blogs the industry's gone to the dogs i can't remember if i cried when viacom's lawsuit was denied 
Something touched me deep inside the year. The media died. So bye bye those big up front buys. Pitched my client who was client, but the pitch didn't fly. And old ad boys were drinking martinis dry. Singing tech is taking us for a ride. Algorithms got me cross-eyed. Did you get the I/O form? And can you tell me which ads performed? Wanna make her ask you so? So you get the idea, right? So, so one thing you can see just from that, even that early, early clip, is getting the singer that's got a voice that matches the original artist, I feel is absolutely necessary to convey the meaning of the song and really get you into the, into the parody. The more things that you can be like the original song, the better. I often open my lyrics with the exact same first line as the original song or something close to it, because I want you to think that it's the original song coming on. And then of course you realize it's a, it's a parody. So um, that, was, that, was, uh, that was an early one. And by the way, we don't have to just, we don't, we don't have to just parody uh, songs. I'm, I'm of the view you parody any great creative. And so when Dos Equis came out with their most interesting Man in the World series, I felt this is great, some great creative and that warrants a parody. Ladies and gentlemen, the most interesting banker in the world. Back in 2014. He is the life of conferences that he doesn't even attend. Even his non-binding term sheets are binding. He relies on strategic fits, not competition to sell a company. But he can drum up competition, so don't get any ideas. His beard alone has sold businesses for over 10 times revenue. He is the most interesting banker in the world. I don't always use an infographic to depict fragmentation in the digital media ecosystem. But when I do, I prefer the Lumascape. Start merging, my friends. So, you know, look, if it's great creative, I'm going to parody it. I also did the uh, Volvo uh, steering commercial uh, where Jean-Claude Van Damme does the splits. Only I did the splits on the Lumascape. And uh, let's see, oh, with the Old Spice commercial, of course, I had to take my shirt off for, for that one. Um, I've also done these now. There's like a regular series of these. I do them at Cannes. So I'm pretty much every year I do a, a, a new parody. Um, and I started with Can Happy where I uh, imitated Pharrell and my God, my singer was perfectly on Pharrell. But uh, this one in 2017, I think, or 16, um, I decided that Justin Timberlake's Can't Stop the Feeling was so good of a song, I had to parody it all the way down to matching his uh, music video. Here's Can's Got the Dealing. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I do this dealing, it's in my bones. It gets quite hectic, crazy when I'm in this zone. All through the quasette, all through the port. I'm signing up more clients, no need to postpone. I've got my iPhone in my pocket, got some good souls on my feet. And I'm okay, so you get the idea. I, I hear it's a little bit delayed. This, by the way, is tough, it might be challenged. And I, I meant to have a, if you're interested in seeing these videos in real time without this delay on Zoom, because this isn't a perfect uh, um, uh, application or you know, platform to, to show live video, uh, go to our website, go to lumapartners.com, that's L-U-M-A partners.com, go to, con click on content, and then you'll see funny business, go to there and you'll see a whole bunch of these and you can play them uh, at your uh, heart's content. Um, so next up, I figured, why not tackle different formats? And so, uh, you know, why leave uh, Broadway musicals to only gay men? I mean, you know, wh why can't straight people also do uh, Broadway? And so we uh, did a whole series called Ad Tech Miserable uh, a couple of years ago, because that seemed appropriate, right? Um, where uh, our own uh, Susan Marshall 
belted out an incredible solo in I Dreamed a Dream. That's on our website. Please go check it out. And I did a funny one called Master of the Scape. But on this middle one, Do You See Strategic Spy? Um, well, you'll get the underlying uh, original. We decided to do a little bit of a flash mob and surprise all of our guests at our Digital Media Summit event. Take a look at the expressions on their faces. It's not all bad news, right? There's lots of M&A going on. I wish there was a song that could give us, I don't know, some of the good news that's taking place. Do you see strategic spy buying the top firms in MarTech? It is the strategy of people not afraid to write a check. When the counting of proceeds echoes the contractual sums, there will be integration needs when tomorrow comes. Will you join in this crusade? Who will be strong and give a try? Beyond the loom escape, a supply chain to simplify. The deal is so right that your stock could ignite and take high. Do you see strategic spy buying the top firms in Martech? It is a strategy of people not afraid to write a check. When the counting of proceeds echoes the contractual sums, there will be integration needs when tomorrow comes. Will you pay all you can pay so that our returns will be strong? Some will work and some will stray. Will you prove that your deal's not wrong? The bad acquisitions will not be diluted for long. Do you see strategic spy buying the top firms in Martech? Is the strategy of people not afraid to write a check when the counting of proceeds handles the contractual sums? There will be integration needs when tomorrow comes. So, uh, I think from that you can sort of see, you know, the the possibilities, right? Of uh, I just love the idea of a. Uh, Flash uh, Mob, um, I got the idea from um, uh, uh, Megan, who, who did it at her wedding, um, and, uh, and I was, and, and did Ad Tech, and did uh, Les Miserables. So, I mean, how do you turn something like a horrific scenario that was happening in Ad Tech into a positive? Well, that was one. And by the way, it also happens to be true. Strategic buyers were still buying, despite the fact that there was a lot of pain and, and, and suffering going on. All right, so um, last couple here. Uh, we did one last year that, oh boy, uh, talk about sort of taking it to another level. We decided, well, I actually came up with the idea. Well, Queen is one of my favorite, um, uh, Queen is one of my favorite uh, bands. And uh, it was just a fluke that they were coming out with the movie Bohemian Rhapsody at the same time. Uh, but uh, we, I convinced my partners very reluctantly, I might add, um, to to really go all in with two feet and get dressed up as the band and good lord I mean even even Brian Anderson looks like Brian May and and John and I mean oh my god the 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 similarities here are, are madness and there I am as Freddie um, for don't stop me now and again the notion here was we're coming up on our tenth anniversary at Luma we were looking at a decay of what's going on in the ecosystem and a slowdown in deals and I'm like good lord after we built up our market share and done everything we have to this point, good Lord, don't stop me now. And it's one where we really stepped it up in terms of the cameos. Uh, see if you can, how many of these uh, cameos you will spot. Tonight I'm gonna make my client a real good deal and it will thrive. Like a banker defying the laws of gravity. I'm a 
I'm a talking head, keynoting like Pop Scott Galloway. I'm gonna go, go, go. There's no stopping me. I'm mapping out the shape, yeah. For you. Don't stop me now. I'm making such a good deal. I'm raising the hall. Don't stop me now. If you wanna make a good deal, just give me a call. Don't stop me Cause now. I'm making a good deal. Don't stop me yes, now. I'm making a good deal. I don't wanna stop at all. Yeah, we're a rocket ship on our way to Mars on an engagement. We are a winning team We're out of control We're a deal machine Ready to reload Like an atom bomb About to oh, 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 oh Explode I'm mapping out the shape, yeah Five thousand logos That's why they call me Mr. Loomis Cape I'm putting big trades on the tape I wanna make a unicorn And get it for you Anyways, you get you 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 get the idea. Uh, I was told it stopped, but maybe it didn't. Uh, I don't think I can play it anymore now. Um, you get the idea. All kinds of uh, industry, big heavyweights there, you know, participating in parody. And this is when I really discovered the real power of this. Uh, if the senior most people in the industry are not only willing to do your parody, they're 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 dying to do them, but they love doing your parodies. Now, now you're on to something, right? If a banker is trying to suggest that they have relationships with the right strategics, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, we know people at fill in the blank, S4, you know, I can say, yeah, I got Sir Martin Sorrell acting in my parody videos. That's something all together. And we'll talk about how you take that to another level, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is the one that I'm not, I'm not going to show you here because I've yet to publish it yet, but I wrote one about streaming called Stream Wars. Now, the unique thing about this particular parody is um, it's sung to a, a Sia song. Uh, um, and um, uh, it's, uh, how does one get, all right, this was a real challenge, right? How do I get senior people in the industry to participate in this parody? Because the necessity would be that they would wear a wig, a freaking Sia wig. Well. Everyone told me, Jesus, Terry, they heard it. It was a great song, great parody, but there's no chance you're going to get senior people in the industry to don your, their, your seal wig for the parody. Well, I can tell you, turns out that's not true. We got 30 of them to wear the wig and lip sync their line. I am telling you when this comes out, you know, uh, uh, buckle up. This one's a, a funny one. So uh, last couple, uh, I'm going to uh, show you are really just in the last week. In the last two weeks, I made two parodies. This is the consequence, by the way, of work from home. When I you know, have more time on my hands, I guess I get to do more. And uh, it just struck me the other day when I saw Donald Trump shaking hands and doing these pressers. Again, I thought, good Lord. Um, one, one, one lyric in particular came to mind. Uh, and that was this song. Uh, I borrowed a little bit of format here from Randy Rainbow. If you don't know Randy Rainbow, check him out. He's a hilarious parodier on YouTube. But this is uh, my Don't Stand Too Close to Me, custom made for the Donald. Good evening. Alistair Sinjin St. John with Fifth Dentist News, back with a breaking story, an interview with the President of the United States. Your handling of this global pandemic has been characterized as pathetically inept, callously moronic, and criminally incompetent. Can you imagine any other adjectives that would describe your handling of this crisis? Well, I'd like to, but it's uh, pretty hard when you think about it. But you obviously didn't think about it. Your ignorance and stupidity is evident in your very actions. You continue shaking hands, not to mention touching and socializing with infected people. I mean, I'm tempted to call the police. The dumb leader keeps shaking, no social distancing. 
he screwed up so badly Where's the COVID testing beside him? Infected, these people have proved sick They tested positive Now it's a pandemic So you can see if you get the right singer, right? I mean, he sounded so close to Sting uh, in that that uh, it really does make it feel more uh, more appropriate and get the get the message across. Again, that's another example of um, w where you can use comedy to to deliver a, a serious message, right? I mean, th there is a message here that. You know, at least in, from from my political standpoint, we need regime change in in Washington, and so anything I can do, and you'll see more political stuff this year, uh, gearing up to the twenty twenty election. Now, getting back away from politics and back to home, the last one I'm going to share with you is the one I just issued yesterday, which is uh, it's close to home, given given where we are with uh, with this crisis. And uh, well, you be the judge as to whether I uh, walk the appropriate line or not, but. Um, we will survive. It seemed like the appropriate song to utilize to, uh, you know, use as a PSA uh, to encourage social distancing, staying at home, and really as an anthem for hope. Um, so here is We Will Survive. One, two, one, two, three, four. I was afraid, I was petrified Kept thinking I could never live with COVID far and wide And then I spent so many days cooped up in my household ward And I grew bored How much TP could I afford? I now use Slack and of course Zoom I just talked in a webinar that I launched from my living room I should have put on proper pants I should have shaved this five day beard If I'd have known for just one second Look so wet, can we go on now? Go, walk out the door Just turn around now Cause you can't go out anymore Weren't you the one who said they would self-quarantine? Did you think you'd gamble? Did you think your hands are all that clean? Oh no, not I We will survive Oh, as long as we can wear these gloves I know we'll stay alive We do social distancing And we'll be Of ha 
how to mitigate the spread of this very, very seriously. The situation of, of, of that are well delineated in, in the guidelines about avoiding crowds, getting people who are vulnerable to essentially self-isolate. It'll take all the strength we have not to fall apart, not to mention lots of dough for a demand to start. And we'll spend oh so many months just working for recovery. We have to try so we can hold our heads up high. Yeah, you see us, we will bounce back. Won't let COVID-19 virus throw us out of whack. So we felt like spreading wide and just expect us to succumb But now we're doing the right thing Because we're not that bloody dumb Go on now, go Walk out the door Just turn around now Cause you can't go out anymore Weren't you the one who said they would self-quarantine? Did you think you would gamble? Did you think your hands were all that clean? Oh, no, no So um, again, and at the end, I, and by the way, watch this, watch this on YouTube. Um, you can see it on our website, um, I believe, or it will be posted there shortly. Um, check it on, on YouTube because at the end, I, get, I deliver a very serious PSA. I I'd originally planned to have industry cameos for this one and then just concluded it may not have been uh, construed the right way. And so I just uh, left mine in there and then uh, included their cameos. Um, at the very end. That is, uh, that concludes the sort of samples and my conversation here today about comedy and business. Um, look, I hope, hopefully at the end of this, you have a sense for why I do this, uh, some sense for how effective it can be, not just in a general application um, and have great respect for comedians, but also its application in a business context, uh, the science behind it, um, some uh, rules of the road that at least I've concluded are good ones to follow to pursue this and keep your job, um, as well as just some examples that, that, that I've had uh, through my career in, in, in doing a bunch of these. Net, net, I think it can be an incredible uh, tool. It's certainly a differentiator. And if it, what keeps me uh, happy and satisfied uh, with my day job, then great. Uh, then it's a uh, cheaper than therapy sessions, or so my wife tells me. So um, that concludes my thoughts around comedy and business. I thank you all for tuning in. Uh, stick around next week when Anna Milicevic will join me for a conversation back to the day job about the state of industry consolidation for LUMA's work from home webinar series. This is Terry Kawaja signing off.